Hey guys, this is Hunter Levine, and thank you for listening to the Captain's Collective Podcast, brought to you by Skinny Water Culture, Turtle Box Audio, Florida Fishing Products, Costa Sunglasses, and Orvis Fly Fishing. In today's episode, we sit down with Captain Mike Holliday of the Treasure Coast, and in this podcast, Mike shares with us his love for pursuing fish from backwaters to blue waters, and how his past as a writer and photographer, and even at one point a lifeguard, influenced how he navigates his business and fishery today. If you love this show, help us out by subscribing and sharing with others. Your support goes a long way. And make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay up to date. To also learn more about Captain's Collective, head to captainscollective.com. And to see opportunities to fish and travel with me as we begin to build unique trips for listeners, check out our travel page. We hope that you enjoy. Thank you for listening. This is the Captain's Collective. Awesome. Well, hey, Mike, thanks for making some time tonight to hang out and join me on the podcast. Got a chance to fish with Cody today and see just a little bit of Stewart, Florida, which is an area that I haven't spent much time in. And I had a really great day and it was fun to have dinner with you. And I just appreciate you for carving some time out. Yeah, dig it, man. It was it was fun. Uh, Stewart's a pretty unique place. If you haven't been here before, um, you know, it's proximity to the Atlantic Ocean and, and to the Gulf Stream. You know, you can eight miles offshore, you're in 120 feet of water. And you can basically catch everything in the ocean there. And then uh, you're on the southern terminus of the Indian River. So you have a lot of the, you know, historically we had a lot of the big giant sea trout and uh, and big snook, probably the biggest snook around the state. Um, so a lot of unique stuff here. Yeah, and th- that was one of the things I was talking to Cody about because when I got on the boat, I was like, I just want to do whatever the day lets us, you know, kind of just following what the day brings us instead of trying to force something, you know, to happen. And I was really, really surprised by the amount of diversity we were able to do in just one day. And he was telling me more just about the fishery for you. What are the main fish that you target throughout the year? Because I know that you have a wide range. Yeah. So, so it, you know, it it obviously depends on the time of year and what migrates through the area. Um, Inshore, we're primarily snook and tarpon fishing. We do a lot of pompano fishing. Um, and I don't do a lot of blind fishing for pompano. I sight cast them. Um, that's our main inshore stuff. I mean, we have triple tail, we have flounder. Um, we used to have the best sea trout fishing in the world. And uh, for, for big fish, I probably, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, 12 years ago, 14 years ago, 30% of my clientele was guys from Texas looking for trout over 10 pounds. And, mm. These days, um, you know, after we lost all our seagrass about 12 years ago, um, I mean, I'm some years I don't even catch a sea trout. Hmm. So it, it, it's dramatic. And then, and then, you know, we all fish out of bay boats here. So um, we fish offshore a lot. We run the beaches. We tarpon fish. We fish the giant jacks on the beach. Um, this year we've had the giant bluefish on the beach. We get permit on the beach. Uh, we get permit on the wrecks. We get, we do everything. We go out and live chum the tuna, catch the dolphin, sailfish, cobia, everything. It's kind, it's kind of nice. It, it, you know, if you go different places, you really see how little variety they have. Go to California, and you know, what are we doing today? Well, we're, you know, we're tuna fishing, or we're, you know, we're catching some, uh, uh, looking for a swordfish or something, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're here. We have a lot of options and, and stuff you can do in the same day. You can run out and, uh, catch a sailfish and then come back in and beat up on the snook for a little while or go chase a tarpon, do something different. It's, it's kind of nice cause you're not committed to something all day. And also if it doesn't happen, you know, or it's not materializing or for some reason it's off, you can get, you have other options. So you're not stuck. It's, it's nice. Yeah. And it's interesting because. I've interviewed people who kind of have two different leans. Some people are like, I want to be able to catch lots of different species, be able to follow what the weather's doing, what what's the hot bite at the moment. And then you have people who want to really focus and zero in and specialize on one specific thing. For you, was there ever a time that you wanted to zero in or did you start on one species and expand? How did all that play out for you? Uh, you know, career? I started I started young um, snook fishing and it was very ego related. I was kind of a dipshit when I was young hmm. um, or more of a dipshit than I am now. Um, it was an ego thing. I, I only fished for the giant snook. I would go to the bridges. I fished straight hundred pound tasks, big live baits. 
and uh and i just had this thing where i would when i would catch one we would drop a bridge gaff down and snatch its face and pull it up and i would sling it onto the bridge and i always kept a little thing of sodas a little cooler sodas and i'd leave the gaff in its face and leave it on the bridge and walk over to my soda and get out and just stand away from it and let the crowd gather and it was you know, total ego thing. How old were you at the time? Uh, early 20s. Okay. And so for you, you you were in your early 20s chasing all these huge snook. Mm-hmm. What what made the shift for you? How did that kind of turn into you wanting to chase more? And um, Well, so, it, I mean, it started it started when I got a boat. And, and I, you know, I was doing stuff on the beach, um, catching tarpon on the beach during the mullet run and catching pompano you know because i was just a poor boy i was a lifeguard on the beach and uh didn't have a lot of money we go out you know in the winter time we i get there two hours early put out my surf rods catch dinner and i was kind of set so so you know i was always kind of focused on a variety and then when i got a boat i got a little 14 foot ski barge Hmm. um just opened up everything for me all of a sudden you know you can go all the places that aren't beat up by the land anglers and you had access to everything. I mean, I could, on a flat, calm, calm summer day, you can run out front and chase dolphin and sailfish and all the kings you wanted to catch. We we had so much bait at that time, you know, and, and in an afternoon, you pull up on the bait school and, and catch a bait, put a hook in it and throw it out. And you're either going to get a king or a cobia or a bunch of bonitas. You know, you just weed through hmm. barracudas, um, blackfin tuna. Everything would be in the middle of that. You get, a you know... Your next cast, you get a 12 pound mutton snapper. Hmm. So you never knew, and you could always catch plenty of fish to eat, you know. And, and once you start doing that variety of things, you're buying more tackle, you're starting to do more stuff. And it, it wasn't until I was about uh, probably 30 years old before I even started saltwater fly fishing. So I want to get more into that, but I know that leading up to your career as a guide, you also had a lot of other things that you were involved in. I heard at one point you were a writer and photographer mm-hmm. for the Miami Herald. You just said you were a lifeguard. I think that Cody was saying something about the Baywatch was actually inspired by you. Oh, yeah, right. They just couldn't get they couldn't get the cast buff enough at the time. Um, but tell me a little bit about your childhood in Miami and kind of your early work career before you got into guiding. Yeah. So, so I grew up in South Miami, um, red road and 80th street. And back then it was a time when, um, you know, you took public bus to school. Um, we would get on our bicycles. My mom would give me four or $5 and tell me I got to be back for dinner at seven o'clock. And I would take my fishing rods and ride out to Matheson hammock or Tahiti beach go walk on the sandbars and catch bonefish and um and you were saying when you were a kid you, you thought they were sucker fish Can i you, did yeah I share did. that story well so so um my dad wasn't around a lot my dad worked for the government he was always uh traveling and uh my mom worked for the miami beach heart institute and she didn't know a lot about fishing and she bought me these flash cards that were freshwater flash cards and you know i was probably seven eight and I uh, would look at these flashcards and identify different fish. And we would catch these small bonefish out on the flat uh, Matheson hammock. And I thought they were suckers because that's the closest <laughs> thing they looked to on the flashcard. I had no idea they were bonefish. Yeah. You were just throwing them back like, oh, what a trash well, fish. We, we never thought of it as a trash fish. But, we, I mean, we have fun with them, but that's not what we were targeting. Yeah. We were trying to get snapper. Hmm. And uh, you'd see that you'd see the the snapper on the edge of the grass and you throw a shrimp out to them and, and catch them pretty together. And, and sometimes you throw the shrimp and the bonefish will beat the snapper to it. Mm. It was, it was very cool. And it was, I, I spent a lot of times on the canals, you know, fishing from shore and canals in, in, uh, in Miami and, um, spectacular fishing, tarpon fishing, snook fishing. It was all very good. How young were you when you started? Um, I started when I was six and my dad took me fishing. And we went basically snapper fishing, a lot of action. And that's what you want with kids is Mm -hmm. a lot of action. Keep them busy. As long as they're reeling in fish, they don't really, they don't have that ego thing yet. They're not, they just want to catch a fish and every fish is amazing to them. Mm -hmm. And from there, you know, you're, you're, you go from them never touching a fish to show them how to handle it and how to bait your hook. And then all of a sudden they just pick it up. And in no time, you know, I was on my bicycle with a, 
with a uh, bait bucket and some money, stopping at the tackle shop on the way and riding out to Tahiti Beach or the hammock. And then from Miami, you end up in New Jersey. I did. I moved my I moved to Princeton, New Jersey when I turned twelve. Um, I got a. I was going into middle school in Miami and I got selected as one of 60 kids for a new program called busing, uh, which was forced integration. And they were going to send me and, and 59 other kids to George Washington Carver junior high in Liberty city. And at that time there was a lot of tension, a lot mm. of racial tension. And my mom got offered a job at Princeton university. So, uh, we moved up to New Jersey and that was pretty unique. You know, um, it was quite different from, you know, being a little toehead kid and bare yeah. feet in Miami, um, to running around and in it's the areas I was in was very rural. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like being in a city, but still, um, the cast of characters that are around were a lot different than the people I was used to being in. And, and the education was considerably better. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was a little bit behind in school when I came there and uh, had to catch up and, uh, you know, it was a great experience academically for me. And it was good growing up, being around the college. Um, my best friend, his dad worked for the, the Boy Scouts of America. And he got us access. We would go fishing all the time in streams. We picked up fly fishing pretty young. And uh, we would travel to different places that, that, as a kid, I didn't know were, you know, these historic streams. We fished the Catskills. We fished the Beaver Kill. We camped on Catskill Creek. Mm-hmm. You know, we would, get, we would get all these allowances because we were affiliated with Boy Scouts. And, uh, you know, as I got older, then I realized how much of a, you know, good opportunity that was in my life. And then did you go to college after your I time did. in it's high school? It brought me back to Florida. Okay. And, and really, I, you know, all I wanted to do was get back to Florida. Um, I, I came to Jensen Beach to go to FIT, Florida Institute of Technology. They had a Jens- Jensen Beach campus. And I went to the aquaculture program and uh, went to school there for aquaculture got out with a degree in, in, you know, basically fish farming and had three good job opportunities. I could go to Belize and raise shrimp, six bucks an hour, all the cormorants I could shoot. I could go to uh, Seattle and raise salmon for six twenty-five an hour and uh, all the eagles I could photograph or I could go work on the beach for $14 an hour and all the ways I could surf. So that's where I went. And it, it was an amazing job. I, I love being. And what out was beach. that job? What did you focus on when you were doing the beach? Ocean lifeguard. We were all EMTs. We were all medics, mm-hmm. um, and we were a little different crew than you'll see in a lot of lifeguard crews. We were all surfers, mm-hmm. um, big time watermen. You know, when the waves were giant, we were the guys who were out there all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then still, you know, just trying to survive in the South Florida lifestyle is very expensive to live here. Um, so you're fishing at night or you you have multiple jobs. I was working at a tackle shop at night and, um, and that's how I got my job with Miami Herald. Yeah. Tell us about that a little bit. Just uh, what would you write about? Were well, you, were you interested in writing? I mean, no, early no on? interest in writing at all. And, um, I, I was working in a tackle shop and the, the local writer for the Miami Herald was a lady named Jan Fote. And she was doing a story for Florida Sportsman Magazine on catching snook on the beach. And I worked on the beach, and we caught him on the beach a lot. Um, and somebody in a tackle shop told her I was really good at it. So we lined up a day. We went out and fished. And afterwards, she came and interviewed me, and she found out my mom worked at Princeton, and I was very well read. And she had been offered a job from uh, to leave the Miami Herald and go work for the Palm Beach Post, which was her direct competitor up on the Treasure Coast. And that's the way, back in that day, writers didn't get paid very much. And the way they got raises was they, they went to another competitor. Usually the competitor stole you and offered you way more money. Mm-hmm. And that's how you got a 10 grand bump. Otherwise, you got, you know, 25 cents a year raise or 50 yeah. cents a year. You never really moved up that scale. So she had promised the, the Miami Herald she would find a replacement. And quite a few people applied. She came out and talked to me and said, I just think you'd be a good you know a lot about fishing. You talk very well. Um, you know you should just come and try it. And I hadn't really thought about it, but I said, okay, I'll you know I'll go write something. They have me write a dummy article, and um, God, it was horrible. We wrote what was on, it on. We it was on snook fishing, and and we wrote on these monochrome coyote word processors. They didn't have computers in. 
Wow. That's how old I am, you know. Uh, word processor, monochrome, no spell check. And you, and I didn't know how to type. I chicken pecked the whole time. You know, two fingers, click, 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 click. It took me forever to write it. And it, God, it was crap. The writing was so bad. Mm. But I got the job based on her recommendation. Mm -hmm. And then from there, um, I think to be a really good writer, you probably have to write a million words or more and find your voice. Um, I worked at trying to be, trying to improve my writing. I read good writing all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I read prolifically. I did a lot of uh, crossword puzzles to improve my vocabulary. Um, but I had, a, I had an editor, and I'll never forget this lady. Her name was Rory Clark. And uh, she, she would call me up and say, you know, you did this wrong or this is wrong. And she called me up one time, like midnight, and said, uh, you spelled discarded wrong. And I said, oh, you know, how did I spell? And she told me, and I go, okay, well, how's it spelled? And she told me, and I went, oh, okay. Well, thank God, you know, you're there. That's what editors are for. Yeah. Yeah, that was the wrong thing to say. Mm. I had, at that point in my life, I was probably, I was uh, 26 or 20, probably 26. I had never heard that kind of profanity come out of a woman's mouth. Mm. I've been yelled at by girls, but not like that. She tore me up pretty good. And uh, all the way to the point, like, get up right now get a piece of paper and a pencil. I want you to write these things down, you know, AP style book, strunk and white. I want you to go buy these things right now and read them and follow them and don't ever spell a word wrong again. Hmm. And she scared me so much. Uh, I would just, I would get out my dictionary. I would get out my, thesaur, I would get it all out and make sure everything was great. Hmm. And uh, it, it bred really good habits. And from there I, I matriculated into writing um, into the Palm Beach section of the, of the Miami Herald and then uh, started writing for magazines and then would start shooting my own photos. Um, back then, you you know, you got, you got paid for... Some magazines you got paid extra for photos, some you didn't, but you had to have a full package one way or the other. And um, so you had to shoot your own photos. So, mm -hmm. you know, bought a camera and started working with that. Um, and that was all film, shooting all film. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was all trial and error back then. There was a lot of error, man. You you go and, and go out and shoot a five rolls of film and come back and then get them developed, and, and it was all horrible. Wow. For whatever reason. There's a finger in the way or it's not focused focus, or whatever yeah. it was. And, you know, you, you um, didn't have a speed right and the fish is blurred because it's moving. It, uh, it was a mess. So it's a lot of trial by fire. Yeah, and I actually studied creative writing at Florida State. And one of the things that was interesting, though, was a lot of people would come into the program and they thought they loved writing. And then they realized it really wasn't their thing. Like they yeah. liked the idea of it, me sitting down with a cup of coffee and feeling sophisticated or whatever it may be that, that's on their mind for you. What hooked you with that? Because a lot of people, obviously it takes a lot of work. People calling you at midnight, spell check. I'm sure you had people arguing with you about things you uh, wrote. Dude, listen, and there's, you will never write anything that somebody doesn't take umbrage with, mm. ever. Somebody doesn't like something you said, ever. Mm. So, um, you know, you need a, a bit of a thick skin because people will call you up and, and tell you how wrong you are about what you wrote. Um, I, I had a great editor who brought really good habits you know, we always have at least at least uh, two quotes in every story and opposing you know, opinions on things. Ideally, we would have three. Um, just just the style of it helped a lot. What I really liked about it was it was very creative. Um, what, what I you know writing writing um, investigative stories. That's what I mostly wrote for the Miami Herald. Mm -hmm. And then as I as I. I left the beach at one point in time and, and wrote for the Fort Pierce Tribune full time. And um, that was writing. I had the whole back page of sports and I could write columns so I could write opinion. And, the, and I love that. That yeah. was really creative. And then I sort of found my voice, which was kind of sarcasm and being a wise ass and calling mm -hmm. people out on stuff. Um, so uh, once you find your voice, it, it becomes a lot easier when you're writing. Um, investigative stuff it's very cut and dry this is you know i'm going to this guy to get this opinion i'm going to this guy to get this opinion you're not injecting any of your opinion on it at all mm -hmm. you're just saying what he says and what he says and maybe some background um 
facts. But other than that, there's no opinion to it. When you get to write your opinions and, and you can call people out, that's when it really gets fun. And from there, it was just, um, it became easy. Mm -hmm. You know, once I wrote enough words, I went, I went to Florida Sportsman Magazine as an editor. Um, I did that for about a year and a half. Then I went to Maverick Boat Company, ran their marketing for four years. And then I went to Florida Fishing Weekly as the editor of that magazine. And um, once you write enough, it becomes easy. And, mm -hmm. and you find, once you find your voice, you're set. You know, you can pretty much give me any subject and say, you know, I, I want a thousand words or 2000 words about this. And I can just sit down and write. It just comes out. I, I don't, I don't know where it's coming. I don't know where it's going. I don't know what's coming out of my mouth next or my head. But when I get to the end, I go, wow, that came out really good. Or I'll read through it and edit it and go, now I got it. That, was, that came out really well. Um, and if I don't like it, I just crumple it up and throw it away and start over again. I remember being in class and a lot of our professors were always talking about finding your voice and being comfortable in your own skin. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would come into the program and they would think that they're saying something, you know, I'm going to be the college kid who talks about sex and drugs. And we're like, everybody does that, you, you know, it's well, you're very a college derivative. kid. Yeah. But, and, and, but, and, and you're also, it's also what you know best, right? Yeah. But it's also very uninteresting because it's what everybody's saying. And there's this interesting thing about what do you have to say? How do you become comfortable with who you are? And I've noticed in fishing some of the people that I've enjoyed being around the most, and I've found kind of some of the most interesting people in their own way, not in writing, but in the, in their fishing have found their own voice and become comfortable in their own skin. I'm curious in your mind, what are some of those parallels that you learned in writing that you see play out in uh, fishing? This, what I would tell every writer is, um, you know, there's a tendency to want to be formal with your writing to your, to make your writing good. Mm -hmm. Um, and you think to make your writing good, you have to pick the right word or the right phrase for everything you write. And you actually, you have it in your mind how you want it, but it doesn't come out that way. And the trick to doing that is to get a, get a tape recorder and set it down and have the conversation of what you want to write about with somebody else and then play it back and write it the way you spoke it. If you can, if you can learn to write the way you speak, then you can communicate the way you think because you're, you know, you're, it's your brain is just forcing the words to your mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, so once you, once you can find that, that way you speak again, your voice, it just becomes easy. Mm -hmm. And then, and, I mean, you can give me a topic on anything and I can write it. You want 2000 words on a cork in a whiskey bottle. How do you want it? Do you want it anecdotal? Do you want it, uh, satirical? Do you want it? humorous how, mm -hmm. how do you want it i can just sit down and just grind it out and it and i don't know where it's going i have no no set plan on any of it but it'll spew out and by the time you get to the end you go wow you know that came out good do you see ways that that kind of plays out with as you're somebody who's pretty far in your fishing career and you look back at some of those lessons you learned in your 20s doing all that, do you see certain things that you're trying to share with younger people or people in the fishing industry that you learned from that season of life? I, I always try and share. I mean, it, that, that's what you have to do is give back, um, particularly to the other guides. If you're a guide, you know, um, bringing the other guides up right and sharing the things and also making them understand things. If you can help them learn a lesson without having to live it, it helps. Mm -hmm. It helps them. It helps you. Um, and it just moves them further along. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, it, for everybody, you go through your life, you learn lessons. There's good ones and bad ones. And, and half the stuff out there, you just got to learn by trial, by fire. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everybody does things differently. Everybody thinks differently. But it's trying to get a certain mindset about things. Uh, the biggest thing I see in fishing is that, that particularly with youth, is that they don't look forward enough and realize um, the impacts of what they do today on tomorrow. Hmm. You know, like a, you can, you can just keep catching those fish or you can and not have them tomorrow, or you can leave them now that you've had a, what is considered a good day or a good morning and go do something else and, and improve on it that way. And then have them to, to come back in a couple of days and, and get back on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just too much thought. Like I want to, in particular with social media, I want to be the hero 
I want to have lots of photos and, mm -hmm. and, you know, catch the most fish of anybody. I want to catch 25 sail fish today. Yeah. Well, you know, after they about, want to pull the snook on the dock, drink the soda and get the proverbial yeah. and, and, crowd. and the first time you do it, it's great. You know, and I think people need that. I think it breeds a lot of stoke in them. And, uh, and it's just one of those things like you, um, you see over time things change mm -hmm. and, and it's very rarely for the better. So you learn your lessons from the, the things you didn't do to protect it bef before it changed. Mm. And sadly, a lot of those are, you know, are bad lessons, mm. but they, they make a better person. I like, like I was talking before about being, you know, very egotistical about catching these big snook. Mm. Um, I was on a, I was on a, the Jensen Causeway, um, I was probably 27 or 28 years old. And at that time, everybody's throwing the same lure. It's, it's April big snook are out there. Most of the snook you're catching are big. And, um, and I caught one that was not remarkably big. It was probably 26, 27 pounds. Um, back then we had a lot of fish over 30 pounds. So it wasn't this crazy big fish, but it was a good one. And I knew I had to go, I was leaving town. So, um, I wasn't going to be able to clean it and I wasn't going to be able to eat it. So I let it go. And back then people didn't let snook go. When you caught him, you ate him. Mm. And, uh, I let him go. And I remember going back, um, you know, when I came back into town four or five days later and every time I would go back to that causeway in the spring for 10 years, uh, there'd be a crowd of people. You could, I could hear him in the background going, that's the guy that let that giant snook go. And that stoked my ego. Um, so I started letting everything go mm -hmm. and then it changed my whole philosophy to, you know, if I let him go, I can actually catch him again, mm -hmm. maybe three days later. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, and it was still ego driven at that time, um, uh, until we really started seeing impacts on our, on our numbers of fish. I didn't pull away from that, but the, but the lesson had changed in me to going from, you know, killing snook for glory to letting him go for glory. And then eventually to let him go because it's the right thing to do so that I can catch more tomorrow or, or we have more in our, our fishery for the future. Earlier, you mentioned that you feel like older guides should give back, but obviously there's a lot of, you know, tension often between younger anglers, younger guides and older guides and older anglers. Why do you feel like there's so much tension there from speaking from the older guide standpoint? Um, most of them are dipshits. Most of them are very pushy. And, and you know, you, nobody likes being infringed on the stuff they do. Mm -hmm. um, and seeing people come in and, and squeezing them in areas that they're fishing. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly when they haven't earned it. You know, um, a good example would be when I, when I was guiding, there, were, there weren't many guides here. There was three or four. And, and uh, this new guy came to town, Richie DeVito. And... Um, he started this uh, fly shop called Southern Angler and he's going to be a guide. And, you know, I would run into him every now and then, but never really spoke to him. And it just, we were polarizing because we're both guides kind of pushing for the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I would go out to, I would go out to a sandbar in the morning or I go out where the redfish were and he would be there. And I would go, you know, out on the beach, Jason Tarpon, and he would be there. The guy put in his time and, and in a very short amount of time, um, you know, he was very accepted and it was, mm -hmm. we got along. He put in the effort and the time. It's a lot of the guys that just haven't earned the effort mm -hmm. and the way things have changed now, um, back when our, when our habitat was so, so vast and there were so many fish, everybody was spread out. And now, um, everybody's fighting just to have a decent day. Mm -hmm. Um, so back in the day when new guys would come, if you fished a spot, like if I fished around bird Island all the time, none of the guys would fish around bird Island. That's Mike's spot. That's where he hangs out a lot mm -hmm. and spends a lot of time. So you kind of, the areas that were your go-to spots were, were kind of reserved for you. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to bring somebody in, if somebody called you up and said, dude, I'm struggling and you wanted to bring them in, you would bring them in, but you had to make the invitation. They're not just going to pull up and say, I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. Um, and nowadays it's just open game. They see you on a dock, 
two days later, they can go to that dock. So, and there's only a limited amount of docks that have fish because that's what's left of our habitat is docks or seawalls or rock piles, little stretches of mangroves, but not much. The fish are very concentrated on areas of the shoreline. We lost probably 75% of our habitat. And uh, so now, you know, everybody's just trying to catch fish. And, you know, if you sit on a spot for two hours, they know you're catching fish. Mm -hmm. And the next day they're there. And, and that dynamic has changed a lot. There's a, in, in my area, there's a, you know, there's a handful of us that share with each other, um, that have everybody in the groups kind of earned their right to be in the group, mm -hmm. um, giving away stuff that they, you know, the other guys needed it more often than not. Um, as a young guide, if you want to get the respect of the older guys is tell them something they don't know, share with them something and don't ask for anything in return. And it comes around mm -hmm. like you, they start respecting you for finding that because they can't, you can't be everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're having a hard time catching bait and they give you a little dude, you know, baits over here. I wish you wouldn't tell anybody else, but it'd be nice, but it's over here if you need it. Um, that goes a long way with people mm -hmm. um, to help save their day. The fact that you make an effort to make their day. Okay. Goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And then, and then slowly you'll start reciprocating as you get back to the dock. But, it, but I mean, as a rule, um, if you have things to yourself, you don't like seeing other boats there. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have, if you have, uh, you run in the beach and you have eight schools of jacks and two boats out there, you know, odds favor, you're going to catch all the jacks you want. If you have eight schools of jacks and you have 20 boats out there, you know, odds favor the jacks school you get on has already been beat up and, they're already too key and, you know, much more difficult. Mm. And you had mentioned that when you started guiding, there were only a handful of guides around. Mm -hmm. Zero me in on that moment of your life. What was it like for you to begin? How did you get into it? Yeah, so, um, uh, you know, it's funny because when I was a little kid, that's what I wanted to be. I didn't want to be a policeman or a fireman. I want to be a fishing guide. Mm. But I never really thought of it. I never really thought after that, you know, as I went to college and – started getting older. I never really thought I wanted to be a fishing guide. Mm -hmm. I was working in a tackle shop in Jensen beach and the New York Mets had just built their spring training stadium out in Port St. Lucie. Mm -hmm. And the coach of the Mets was Davey Johnson. The pitching coach was Mel Stottlemyre. And they came into the tackle shop and said, you know, we're looking for a guide. Um, there was one guide in the town and he was busy. But I said, I'm, I'm going fishing tomorrow. If you guys want to go with me, you can go with me. I, I had just got my little 14-foot boat. And we went out on the beach and chased those big jacks and uh, had a pretty good day, caught a bunch of big fish. And we came back, and David Johnson pulled me aside and said, you know, you'd be a really good fishing guide. He said, I, I, I travel all over. I fish with lots of guides. He said, you have a really good personality. You understand the fish. And you kind of – you have that uh, – thing where you th trying to think about what the fish are doing and why they're there not just how to catch them mm -hmm. uh, i said you should really do it and i was you know i said uh you know i don't know man but the more i started thinking about it uh the more i was like okay i could probably do this this would be kind of fun and uh so i went and got my captain's license and started guiding and it, you know at that time i'm guiding i mean i'm work i'm working on the beach as a lifeguard i'm writing for the miami herald on my days off in the mornings and then I'm guiding in the afternoons or, or during the week at night. So, uh, I was working a lot and yeah. I, my whole life has been that way. I mean, I've, I've worked three jobs my whole life mm -hmm. in which you, you know, you have this trade out. You can work a job you don't love and for the money, or you can do the jobs you love and you may have to work more or several different things to make the same amount of money, but you love every minute of it. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to be in that position. As you're sitting here now and you've been guiding for 37 years. When Feels you like 137, man. <laughs> what, in your mind, when you think about what makes a great guide, what, what comes to mind? So, you know, there's a lot of attributes. Um, the single best thing about the, all the best guides have, um, intuition is the ability to pull up to somewhere and go, that's going to be good or that's going to suck. Mm -hmm. You know, you might, you might be out on the beach 
chasing tarpon and, and there's no tarpon. And for some reason they're offshore, you're running the beaches, you're not seeing any fish and it's noon and you go, okay, well, you know, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to turn and run north 30 miles. Mm -hmm. And you run that 30 miles and you shut down and the water's crap. And the guy who doesn't have intuition will try and grind it out in that crap water. The guy who has intuition will go, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. I'm going another direction again, or we're going back because it's better than this. Um, and, and that intuition is it's, you'll see it in every good guide. Mm -hmm. They just have the ability to pull up and go, it just doesn't look right. We're out of here. Not, it doesn't look right. Let's try it. Yeah. Um, and, and what you learn over time is you can't grind it out. You mm -hmm. may luck out and get a fish or two, but it's mm -hmm. never a good day. You just, it doesn't grind out. And that's mm -hmm. the single best attribute that I see in, in the really good guys. And, and, you know, I've, I've been fortunate. Um, when I started, there weren't a lot of guys and there weren't a lot of guys to learn from. Um, but as a writer, I traveled all over the state, um, interviewing guides. Yeah. So if I want to learn about catching sea trout, I just find out who the best sea trout guides and go fish with them and write stories about fishing with them. Mm -hmm. um, and what they do and help them drum up business. And I might be out on the water and they say, look, you know, can you not print this part? This yeah. is like a little secret. And I go, yeah, sure. But I might use that part. Yeah. You know, so you learn from that. I, I had the, the fortune to be out with a lot of very good fishermen mm -hmm. um, early in my career and learn from a lot of them. Mm. And is that something that you think can be developed or do you feel like a lot of those people just naturally kind of have good intuition? I think they, I think it's both. I think when you first start out, you don't trust your intuition. So you have to kind of learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. And, but after a certain amount of time, it just, it just clicks. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it develops in many different ways. Um, you'll get to where well, a good example, I'm, when I'm looking, I'm out on the beach or I'm out offshore and I'll see something, I'll see a green color in the water or, or a different color. And I'm, I tilt my head to go, what is that? Year, when I first started guiding, I would look and go, what is that? And then, holy crap, it's a school permit. Um, now I know if I tilt my head, it's fish. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I tilt my head at all, I'm going, get a rod, get a rod. I don't know what it is yet, mm -hmm. but I know it's fish. Mm. Um, so you kind of, you build those instincts over time. And that's, that's the learn part of it. Um, the part of being able to pull up and just go, uh, your gut tells you it doesn't mm -hmm. lie, man. You know, you pull up and, and everybody's there with, they were whacking them yesterday. They, you pull up and it's nothing's going on mm -hmm. and you're, everything you're looking at says it's wrong. It's wrong, man. Leave. Yeah. Like, like you can't grind it out. Everybody, you don't wait till everybody else leaves mm -hmm. and then leave. Be the first one. And that's what you'll see in, in a lot of the really good guys. They pull up and they're just, you're like, but where is he going? It's going to go off here. And, and he's out of there. He knows it's not going off. Mm -hmm. So, so um, it's a, it's a, it takes time to figure out the conditions and to figure out the scenarios. Mm -hmm. But, but the scenarios are very consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in fishing, most of the stuff you do is pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. Um, even fooling the fish, you know, and how they act and how they respond and their body language. And, you know, a fish has a brain the size of a pea. So you got a brain the size of a walnut, maybe a little bit bigger. You ought to be able to outthink it. Right. Yeah. And, um, they just basically want, you know, three things. They want comfort. They want a steady source of food and every now and then they want to reproduce, mm -hmm. which is same thing a guy wants. Mm -hmm. So you kind of think the same. Um, you should be able to outthink them a little bit and then just pay attention. Mm -hmm. If you don't pay attention, you have to seek out why that fish is there. And then if you can figure out why that fish is there, then you can find that scenario in another location and duplicate it mm -hmm. or in multiple locations and duplicate it. And, and that's when it opens up your whole fishery to you, mm -hmm. um, to where you just can run large areas and just see what you're looking for and stop and be on them. Yeah. Um, and that, that's just a, an experience thing and a, and a noticing it thing. And, and, you know, it takes time to do that. That's the, that's the, 
the downside of being young and in the industry. You make a lot of mistakes. Um, you have an ABC place to go. You don't have two alphabets of places to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you, when something's different, when they're dumping water or when they're, when the water's cold, um, you just haven't experienced that scenario enough to know, okay, historically when they dump water, the fish go here, mm -hmm. you know, so this is where I'm going to start to look. And then when you start looking there, then you can start narrowing it down by other factors. Mm. Um, you just don't have that experience. It takes some years to do that unless you have somebody telling you about it or, or you ask somebody if the smart ones will ask, mm -hmm. um, you can ask me anything. I will not lie to you. I will tell you, I might not tell you, I might say, I can't tell you that, but if I tell you something, it's, you know, it's basically going to be true and hopefully it's going to help you. Yeah. And so when I started this podcast, my main motive was only to get a chance to meet people, learn from them. I knew it would be fun. That was kind of my, mm -hmm. my motive, which sounds like when you were in writing kind of became the thing you loved about it, which is definitely what I love about this is getting the opportunity to go places, meet people, learn things from them, hear stories, get the experiences. And see, and see really cool fisheries. Yeah. And I, and I love seeing what makes them different. Uh, and then also the, on the same thing, there's, I, I feel those little things that I can bring back or see play out in multiple places. I love getting a chance to fish in a new style. Like I'm doing something new if I'm, you know, not normally doing stuff with docks or not at mm -hmm. night or I, I really enjoy being a novice, which I think for some people is really hard because they hate, you know, when you are trying to do docks at night and you've never done that before, now all of a sudden you're going to look like the guy who's never done it before. And pretty much back to the ego thing. I think for some people that's really hard. So they mm -hmm. just, but when you look back at all those days for you and you think about the different captains you got to meet and the different experiences and you look back at your career in your mind, are there any people who stand out as people who you really felt deeply impacted by, or you wanted to model big kind of philosophical things from, you know, there's been plenty of people, everybody has influences in their life. Um, guide wise, um, you know, um, butch constable out of Jupiter was the best I've ever seen by far, by far the best I've ever seen. Robert Trossett, Key West, um, Tony Murphy. I got to fish with him some, um, Jerry Metz up in Fort Pierce, some of the old time guys and mm -hmm. old Florida guys. Uh, it was really nice to get out with them and, and spend time with them. And, and those are guys that when they said something, you stop and listen because everything they hand out is a nugget, mm -hmm. a, a piece of gold that you can use the rest of your life. You know, if Butch Constable says, you know, well, you know, wind's going to go north tomorrow, so the dolphin are going to light up. And you go, what do you mean? Well, they, you know, the dolphin bite really well on a north wind. The rest of your life, you look for the north wind when you're going to go dolphin fishing. Mm -hmm. um, so, there, you know, there's that, and then there's just people who influence your life influence your character mm -hmm. um and that goes everywhere from clients on up um you know it, some of it is learned but a lot of it's learned from other people when you talk about kind of the big picture things for for you looking back that you learned what is what do you feel like was the greatest lesson that you got along the way be humble be humble it's just fishing man you know anybody can do it it's not if Everybody puts in the time. It's a time thing. If you put in the time, it's like anything. There are no shortcuts in your life. Doesn't matter what you do. I tell my my kids that too. Like there's no shortcuts in school. There's no sh shortcuts in work. If you want to be the best at what you do, you got to grind it out and you got to you got to put in the time and make the effort. And that's cumulative and it adds up. Hmm. And you become a better person from it and you become better at what you do. Um, if you don't put in the time, it's going to sooner or later, it's going to bite you on the ass somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you're going to get, you know, either, either pushed out as a fraud or, um, you know, learn a serious lesson. that's going to set you back a little bit. Mm. Um, if you put in the time, you'll be fine. Yeah. And thinking about shortcuts for me, I think when I look back, the, the times that I was grabbing for shortcuts, I feel like I was just on the wrong road. Like for a lot of people, If yeah. you're doing something you really love, you, 
why why even take a shortcut like if you can enjoy learning if you can be okay going out and having some bad days and if you can be okay with some of the hard lessons and you can enjoy it like if me and you were walking on a road and it was a really great road we wouldn't be looking for shortcuts we'd just be enjoying it uh, a couple things everybody has a bad day everybody any guy that tells you he doesn't he doesn't have a bad day he's a liar all guys have bad days um, and everybody hates bad days, but you learn from those bad days. If I, if I go somewhere and I fish all day and I don't catch anything, you know, and on a, on a typical day, I probably hit between 10 and 12 spots, 10 and 12 locations and four hours of fishing, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, if I don't catch anything, well, I've eliminated 10 or 12 places and also kind of narrowed down why you know i look at why aren't those fish in that location or in those locations when well, i'm looking at a, either water temperature or water clarity or thinking the baits in a certain spot and it's not so it tells me the next day where not to go and gives me a little direction on what to do maybe change things up maybe they're not on mullet it's mm -hmm. a fall mullet run but there haven't been a lot of mullet around maybe they're not on mullet you know maybe they're still on the pilchards or maybe there's a bunch of ballyhoo up in the mouth of the creek or maybe the mullet's just further up, further up river, you know, mm -hmm. 10 more miles. Um, so, so, you know, you just kind of have to have that adaptive thinking most of the time to get out, to get out there and just change it up. But you learn every day, whether you, whether you skunk it or not. And, mm -hmm. and man, everybody skunks. That's just, that's just life. And, and as you become a guide, it, the pressures on you to produce, um, increase tremendously. So, um, you try and learn ways to make it easier and your, your skill level of your clients is different as mm -hmm. well. You have, you have, I mean, it's great when you have a client who's really good, particularly when you're fly fishing, but even, even with lures, um, you know, not everybody can throw a lure accurately. They just want to fish with lures cause that's what they're used to. But if, if they can't fish lures well, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of stuff like snook fishing, you know, we're going to catch two. There's three of you on the boat. We're going to catch two throwing lures. We'll mm -hmm. catch 20 using a live bait. Let's go to live bait just to improve your experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and then at the same time, uh, you know, you're learning by seeing the fish feed and how they react to baits and how they chase them and movements. And you'll learn something that you'll be able to transition into your fly fishing or your lure fishing later on. Mm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Speaking of writing, I wanted to make sure we got into a little thing known as Mexico Returns. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so tell me about Mexico Returns. What is it? Where did it come from? How is it changing the world? Well, it, so so um, back in the, you know, around 2000, the internet was still in its infancy and, and um, uh Forums were big, pop, were pretty popular on the internet. There wasn't, you know, there wasn't the social media that you have now. Um, so that's where people kind of got gathered to talk and, and bring up subjects and all. And um, I was an editor of a magazine called Florida Fishing Weekly. And most of the guys, you know, when, when you work in an office, um, you get breaks. Uh, you get 15 minute breaks, mm -hmm. you get lunch breaks, you know, and guys would go smoke cigarettes or they go do something. I just would, I would go on the Drake magazine forum mm -hmm. and mess around. And, um, there was a big cast of characters, a lot of people in the fly realm, um, that were on there at that time are, you know, are pretty big names in, in fly fishing these days. And, um, there, there was a, um, edge we'll use for the forum on the Drake. Um, like the first time you post, you're supposed to show they had rules. You, when you post, you're supposed to show, uh, fish porn, ideally not you in the photo, just fish, you know, you cut out yourself and just, just have the, the nice brook trout or whatever it is. Um, boobs, some kind of boob photo and pie, some kind of pie photo post those three things and and you know a typical post would be you know hey you know i'm from florida kind of like the salt stuff um yeah have at it and that's all you would say and post your photos and it didn't matter it didn't matter if you did it right or you did it wrong you immediately got slammed 
Mm-hmm. You know, the first response is going to be, you know, welcome Mike, die in a fiery crash. <laughs> and it would yeah. go downhill from there. Yeah. I mean, seriously downhill. But what it really was, it was guys testing the fact that you had thick skin and just didn't really take it all very seriously. Mm-hmm. If you got irate, they would eat you alive. If you just laughed it all off, then you're one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it started that way. And I would go on that forum and, and you know, I, sarcasm's my life. So um, I would mess around with people quite a bit. And um, it got to where there was a lot of guys... Uh, a lot of people on their first or initial post would come in and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to Mexico or I'm going to Belize. Um, on my honeymoon, just want to know if anybody knows any do it yourself walking fishing. And, you know, and the response would be, Hey, welcome man. Die in a fiery crash. Yeah. And it would yeah. just start from there. But I would go in and I would look at where they're going and I would make a little trip and plan it out. And I would write them a whole sequence of stuff they had to do. Totally made up. <laughs> and, and it always ended up you know, involving sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and catching fish. Mm-hmm. Um, but but some of the stuff I would make you do, you know, like if you're gonna you're in Hawaii, you're gonna go to the pond of the Seven Kings, and you know it has the itch mud. So I need you to cover your legs with Astro Glide when you walk <laughs> through the mud, and and just have things like that that you would have to do. <laughs> and uh, over time, it those those little things got a pretty good following. And one of the guys on the Drake said, you know, I, I put books together. Let's, you know, bound one up. So they took a bunch of the posts and, and I was born in Mexico. So my name on the Drake was Mexico initially. And then they had to do some work on the Drake. So they, they shut the, the website down or the forum down for a couple of days or a week. And I didn't know my, I didn't know my password. I couldn't get back on. And it was like three weeks before I could get back on. I had to just make another name. Yeah. So I, I, the name was Mexico Returns. And uh, very few people knew who I was at the mm. time. Um, and, you know, a bunch of people helped with some of the posts. We put it all together and put it out there. It's on Amazon. Yeah. It's, uh, it's total sophomore guy humor. It is not serious. You want to learn how to fly fish? This isn't the book for it. Mm-hmm. If you want a quick read on the plane... Um, yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah. And I feel like that's, um, I think that humor has a, you know, you've you talked a lot about ego. I think humor has a way of kind of breaking up. Don't take yourself too serious. You said if guys get, you know, taking themselves too serious, have a big ego, whatever it is. Humor has a, a purpose too. You know, it's not just to have a moment of joy and, and it, laugh. It, well, it does. And it brings, it brings about epiphanies without having to be rude. Mm. And and a lot of times, you know, it's just like you can, it's almost like a hint for some Mm. people. And if they get the hint from enough directions, they go, Oh God. Okay. (laughs) Maybe, maybe I, maybe, maybe I don't look good in these jeans. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And that, and that place was, you were getting hinted at from every direction possible. I've been told the internet hasn't gotten better about that, but (laughs) I can't imagine. So, um, and, and, you know, it was interesting because a lot, I mean, there were, there were a lot of battles fought, um, on that forum, you know, mm-hmm. little things in the keys that needed to be worked out. Um, things in Louisiana that needed to be worked out, Colorado. It was, it was pretty interesting. There gets, there would get some heat on there every now and then. Mm. Well, my last question, just cause we're running out of time is if you could give one lesson from your life to every young listener, what would that lesson be? <clears throat> wow. Really good question. Um, you know, there are no shortcuts in work in, in, in accomplishing anything in life. Um, but you also need to stop and enjoy it. You know, it's real easy and particularly these days. Um, uh, you know, I, I worked my, my life. I had always three or four jobs. I have four jobs right now. And, um, I, I myself don't do it enough. Stop and enjoy what's in front of you. And, and respect it for what it is, you know, a, a, a lot of that stuff will be gone tomorrow. It goes quickly and, and the environment changes, things change about the areas, things change about you. Um, if you stop and enjoy it a little bit, your life will be so much better. You won't mm-hmm. be as angry. You won't be as sad. 
um, it brings more happiness. You know, we're, we're made to work so we can do the things we want to do, not work all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's gotten to, to in this country to where, you know, everybody's working all the time and not doing enough of the things they want to do. And it's sort of backwards. Mm-hmm. We're supposed to enjoy our lives. Uh, otherwise, you know, they're gone in a blink of an eye and, and you go through it without really living, mm-hmm. live, travel, do as much as you can. There's things you want to do. You want to try riding a Harley, get on one, mm-hmm. you know, you want to go ride a sand rail, do it. You want a bicycle from, you know, Florida to Chicago, do it. Uh, don't let it, don't let any, there's no constraints, mm-hmm. you know, and, and the younger you, 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 take advantage of that the more opportunity you have as you start getting older and you start getting more uh you start building your family and and you know and start having restrictions on the things you can do um and the ability to do those things um your priorities change a lot you know and you don't have those opportunities like you do when you're young um travel's the big one you know it it, like if i want to go travel i got i got i gotta buy tickets for five (laughs) you know and sleeping accommodations for five and a rental car for five when it's just you so it's a lot easier to do that's good and don't take it too seriously man you know as full of shit as anybody else and if you need little nuggets of advice just go ask mexico return oh you'll get in trouble if you do that (laughs) well mike i appreciate it man thanks for coming on the show and it's been great to hang out with you dig it enjoying it Hey guys, thanks again for listening to the Captain's Collective Podcast. Just one more quick reminder to subscribe and follow us on social media. And make sure you check out our hosted trip opportunities at captainscollective.com under the travel page.